Let's turn to Luke chapter 2. A nice Christmas passage. Amen? Luke chapter 2. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm titling today's message, Christmas. That's a good title. <laughs> I like it. Christmas, yes. Receiving your newness of life. Receiving your newness of life. And I'm, and I'm trusting to, to bring some kind of light and revelation to this whole and a comprehension to Christmas and its implication on, it, on every one of us. Amen? All right, so let's begin here in Luke chapter 2. And let's read from verse, let's just read straight through from verse 10 to 14. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Say all people. Does all people leave out any? Amen. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I'm going to read this passage again and, and pick on a few words and make a few comments. Verse 10. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, observe this. Wrap your mind around this. You are able to get this. I bring you good tidings, good news of great joy. Now there is something about joy when you look at it scripturally. That has to do with the end result, with the, with the final outcome. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, that for the joy, talking about Jesus going to the cross, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, in spite of the shame. Because of what he saw beyond it, because of the joy, it gave them a strength to go through it. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, talking about Jesus, many of us will believe in a Jesus whom we've never seen. Whom having not seen you love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. How many times have you seen believers on yourself where you've rejoiced over the reality of Christ in you and the reality of spiritual truth and a Jesus whom you've never seen? But yet you rejoice and you'll put your, you'll put your life on the line you will suffer ridicule and all of that. Why? There is a joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So there is a, there is a joy that is connected up with this final outcome, seeing this end in the beginning. So it says here, there is, there is I bring you good news, good tidings of joy. There's going to be a great joy. There is a good outcome to all of this which shall be to all people, to every human being, without exception. Why? Because unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, which is the Anointed One. D because of that, this is why there's going to be this excessive great joy to every human being. It will be available to everyone, because unto us is born this child. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, when Isaiah was prophesying this, he says, for, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. A child was born. Mary provided the body, the physical body that brought Jesus here. But unto us a son is also given. Jesus was always the son of God. He never stopped being the son of God. The son of God was not born. The child, Jesus um, the, 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 a child was born, but a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Mighty God is Jesus' name, because Jesus is God. 
Christ is God. Mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The one that is responsible, that word peace, to reconcile everything to God's original intent. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. On earth peace, goodwill towards men. He is the prince of peace. On earth there is going to be peace. Now what, what peace are we talking about here? Are we talking about no more wars? Are we talking about no more conflict? No more ridicule? No. Because the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, Think not, Jesus said in verse 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. So this seems to be a contradiction. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Because he's not talking about that kind of peace. He's not talking about that interpersonal peace. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law daughter against her mother-in-law, etc., etc. So that's not a peace he's talking about. What peace is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that, you see, God had an original plan from before the foundation of the world. And it is a good plan. It is a good future. It was wonderful. It was great until sin came and messed it up. But Jesus came to fix that problem so as to reconcile us onto God's original plan and purposes. So when he says there's peace on earth, he's talking about a reconciliation and a restoring to what God had originally intended. God was not going to settle for, okay, fine, we get sin all forgiven and so on. No, God's original plan is still in force. Why would a perfect God settle for anything less than his best? And then for eternity, God will just have to live with the fact that, yes, I got them forgiven, and I got them to make it to heaven, but all these other stuff that I wanted to do, I just couldn't do it. Can you imagine if you, God, have having to live with that? No. In this reconciliation and in this peace, it is complete, it is perfect to, to God's original intent and, and purpose. So when he said peace on earth, it means then that the whole sin problem, the whole separation between man and God was going to be so corrected, so fixed, that towards the earth, towards man, God is peace. God is not mad at anybody because the price has been paid for that complete restoration. Amen? Hallelujah. So peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Jesus, the Bible says in Colossians 1.20, having made peace through the blood of his cross, what for? To reconcile all things unto himself, whether they be visible or invisible, whether they be in heaven or whether they be in earth. The blood of his cross, that work of the cross, that work of his sacrifice, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, was for the purpose of reconciling everything, and that's the peace we're talking about. Amen? Hallelujah. The Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, Jesus came to put away sin. To put away sin. What sin? Is it just wrongdoing? No. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all of sin and what? Come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is the excellency of God. It is his majesty. It is his mercy. It is every good, and all of his qualities are good. It is every, the very essence of his being, his faithfulness, his goodness, his power, his authority. All of it is the glory of God. The sum total of it is the glory of God. So sin has separated us from that. So sin is separation. Sin is that, is that gap that has been created. Is that missing of the mark. So when Jesus came to put away sin, he came to fix that. He, he came to undo that. Amen? To bring correction to that by the sacrifice of himself. That's the reason why Hebrews 2 verse 10 doesn't just simply say that Jesus died so that we can be forgiven. What does it say? It says, it says that he came to bring many sons to glory. To bring us into the excellency of God that we had been separated from because of the fall. Amen? So when you receive Jesus and you receive his sacrifice, what should happen? Romans chapter 6, 
let's just flip, flip over there briefly. Romans chapter 6. And verse 3 says, Know ye not, so many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ. When you're born again, you accept Jesus. You were baptized and immersed into Christ. Therefore, you were also buried with Christ by baptism into death. And that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, you were also raised up from the dead. And therefore, you ought to walk in newness of life. You ought to walk in this new life that you now have. And that, one, that is what the focus of this message is about. What is this newness of life that you and I are to walk in? What is this newness of life? And this is what it is. This is the, the, the core of what needs to be communicated today. This revelation of Christmas, so that when we comprehend what it's all about, why he came, and recognize what is this newness of life that we ought to walk in, that ought to be a reality to us. And it's to capture that. Because without that, then Christmas is what? What is it? I know it's been commercialized and everything. But even outside of that, the comprehension of what it's all about. Why did he come? What was this all about? Yes, Christmas means the anointed one. Christ, God himself, anointing a man. Christ, the anointed one. And the celebration of him. The celebration of the unveiling of this anointed one. Amen? So let's, let's, so let's look at this here with the objective of getting a hold of what is this newness of life. What is this all about? First, let's have a quick glimpse of who God is because Jesus, he is the mighty God. Jesus is God. The Bible says he is the word made flesh. Isn't that right? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God and came and dwelt among us. The word was made flesh. Isn't that right? You say Jesus is God. He's man, yes, but he's God. All right, let's, so let's get a, just a quick little picture of, of, of this awesome God that God the Father is, that God the Holy Ghost is, but that God Jesus also is. Isaiah chapter 57. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 57 and verse 15 says, for thus says the high and lofty one that inhabited, this is where we live, inhabited eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. Notice the word humble. To revive the spirit of who? The humble. And to revive the heart of the contrite. In other words, to revive means it's, to, it's like to bring alive and it's to impregnate with life. Who does he impregnate with life? The humble one. But what does it take to be humble? Does it mean being a doormat? It has everything to do with your perspective of God and, and, and how, how you are in relationship to him. So let's, let's have a peek at that just a little bit. He inhabits, he's a high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. Eternity, e infinity. Eternity has to do with infinity. It has to do with um, perfection. It has to do with, with forever. This word infinity, just for a moment, is the unlimited extent of time, space, quantity. Now, God is omnipotent, meaning what? He has infinite power. It is immeasurable. He is omniscient. Omniscient, meaning what? He's all-knowing. He has infinite awareness, understanding, and insight, and he possesses all of of, of universal and complete knowledge of everything at one time. There is nothing he doesn't know. You can't tell him something, and he says, oh, that's really good, right? We can't, you know, the, the Bible says the thoughts of God are as high. Let's flip over there just for a moment, just to capture this. It's just two pages back. Isaiah 55, just for a moment. Because I want us to capture the majesty of God and recognize what a privilege it is to have him living on the inside of you. And why this Christmas, this Christmas and what it celebrates is so important. But it must be more than a celebration. It must be a reality. 
It must be an experience with God, with him, with his life, with truth. It says in verse 8, Isaiah 55 and verse 8, For my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts. But if God's thoughts are not my thoughts, then are my thoughts his thoughts. Are your way or or neither are your ways my ways, say the Lord. For as the heaven are higher than the earth, so much higher are my ways than your ways. There's a verse of scripture that says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. It is amazing how every one of us, every one of us, at some point in time, all of us, where we are right in our own eyes and many issues. Without exception, that applies to every one of us. Uh, uh, um, for so long, and, and unfortunately, we, can just, we still continually deal, deal with that. But yet, he says his ways are so higher than our ways, and his thoughts than our thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and return it not thither. Now think about it. The rain comes down, the snow comes down, and it doesn't go back up. All right, the rain doesn't go back up. In other words, God has to tell us rain doesn't go up. Snow doesn't go up. I mean, if I say, if, if I, I mean, it's like, duh. Um, is this what he thinks that he needs to tell us this? Is this how, is this the gap in our comprehension and in our understanding? Is this kind of gap that his thoughts are so high that he has to tell us, hey, there's no up rain. There's only down rain. Hello? All right, come on, stay with me now. <laughs> For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and return it not thither, but water with the earth. It waters the earth. The Bible says that we were made from the dust of the ground. It water with the earth. So are his thoughts. And it, it, it makes it bring forth. It might not want to bring forth. It might not feel like bring forth. It may have a will of its own, but that water will make it bring forth. The word of God and the thoughts of God, when it can penetrate the human heart, will make it bring forth. And bud, say I'm budding. <laughs> that it may give what? Seed to the sower and bread to the eater. This is God's system. God gave his son as a seed so as to have many sons. Even God operated by this principle that he had to give himself as a seed. Is in order to bring many sons to glory. Amen? He says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. So God says the same way the rain comes down, it doesn't go back up. The snow comes down, it doesn't go back up. My thoughts come down. God is also saying that you can't give me your thoughts or give me your wisdom. The Bible says the, 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 the wisdom of the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Amen? And I'm saying this just for us. Not to, for, not to belittle ourselves, but for us to see how enormous, how unsurpassing his understanding is. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11 um, that um, all, all the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Psalms 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. He's omniscient. Understands everything at all time, at any point in time. He is also omnipresent. He is present everywhere at the same time in all eternity. He's not only present everywhere, but he's present everywhere in time. Think about it. He is already in the future. Think about it. He is already, and he's anywhere in the past. He is there too. He is omnipresent. Um, and he's omnipotent. Could this be what Jesus was talking about when Jesus says, look here, let me show you how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Was Jesus saying, when you come to the Father, come and recognize him as Father, but recognize, hallow his name. Get a grasp, get a vision, get a perception of who he is, who you're dealing with, how awesome, how majestic, how infinite he is. Because you see, we need to look at God for who he really is. There is none like him. There is none beside him. Your perception of God will affect your ability to receive. Many times people's perception of God is shaped by their life's experiences. 
It's shaped by their own experience. It is shaped by the past. It is shaped by, by what someone else has told. It is shaped by a whole lot of things that is not the truth, for he is the truth. And that affects their ability. I mean, to receive. If they see God as stingy, right, they might just, I mean, you know, they, they might cry and beg God for $10 and think it's a great work of faith. Amen? Tip perception. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, I am Alpha and I am Omega. God is infinitely vast. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. We're right there. Isaiah chapter 40. Glory to God. Look at verse hmm, 12. Who had God had measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Can you imagine all the water on the entire earth? God took it and measured it in his hand. This is just his hand. And measured it in his hand. And he meted out heaven with his span. And comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. And weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Think about it. The scientists say that you, to just, I mean, to just, just the universe that we know, just what they know, they talk about light and, they, and uh, uh, they talk about light years. They talk about the fact that a star that we see right now, the light left that star millions of years, light years ago, and it just arrived to the point that, it may have, that now that we are seeing this picture of the light from these stars, that star may be long gone. Think about it. If you were to travel the, 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 the distance or the length and the breadth of this universe, it is zillions of light years. Our mind cannot even conceive that. And he spanned it all with his hand. He weighed it all, all the waters in his hand. It goes on to say, who had directed the spirit of the Lord? And this is Isaiah's insight. Or who had who had given him counsel? Who talked to him? Who said, God, this is how you ought to do it? Or who instructed him? With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him? Who taught him in the paths of judgments and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold the nations. Check this out. The nations are as a drop of a bucket. And they are counted as small as dust of the balance. The nations, the nations, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. Now, if you were to add all the, there were six, seven billion people on this earth, something like that, which I understand the amount of people on the earth right now is more than the sum total of everyone that has lived. Well, if this went on for a while longer and we get to 30 billion or something like that, 30 billion people is like a drop in the bucket. Amen? Not only that, they are like the dust on a scale, which is to say what? Imagine 30 billion people. They're like the dust on a scale, which, you know, the scale will still balance with a little bit of dust on it, will it not? It is as if to say the nations don't even show weight. They're like the dust. And you're talking about 30 billion people. Now, let's divide this down to you and me. And then let's look at the gray matter between here. I'm really impressed with me, am I not? You get my point? What am I saying? I'm just trying to get an image of the majesty, the excellency of this God in whom we serve that is now living on the inside of you and the inside of me. David in Psalm 19 and verse 1 says, um, where are we? 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalms, Psalms 8 and verse, verse mm, let's pick it up in verse 3. David said, when I consider the heavens, when I consider the heavens and the work of his fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. When I, when, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I, 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 I think of this, when I try to get some kind of images in my mind, when I try to, who did this? How, how big is he? How vast is he? What kind of wisdom? What kind of understanding? What is the depth? How does he think? What are his thoughts? And then in the midst of it all, 
David probably had a visitation where God showed up and, and, and manifest himself to him. And David taught in verse 4, what is man? What is man that you are mindful of him, that you would come and visit him? You are so awesome and that you would come and visit. What is man? I believe this perception that David had of God on read the Psalms was so awesome. That's the reason why he was able to receive. It records in the book of Chronicles how David, on one afternoon, out of his own resources, had gathered up for the building of the temple of God and gave seven, what did, did they say? In, 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 folks have calculated it. It's like about $80 billion of his own funds that he gave to the work of the Lord. How could you come up with that kind of money? How could you believe to do that? Because of his concept of God. Because of his perception of God. I mean, this, this was the God he saw. And then here when, here when, this, when this, this, um, what, this, this lion come to attack his, his sheep, he literally went, grabbed the lion by its beard, looked him in the face, and whipped him. Which of us would do that? Where does it come from? Because he's not seeing himself, he's seeing God. He did that when it came with a beard. And then who is this uncircumcised Philistine, Goliath? When it's me and God, man, just give me a, sling, a slingshot and a stone. Why? His perception of God. Now God, the whole thing about faith is faith is able to see. Faith doesn't look at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. It has this perception of God and it has this persuasion. And it's a, and it's a confidence. It is a knowing. It's a proof that we walk after. Amen? All right. So what is the point? This God that we're talking about that is so awesome, so majestic, so full of power and wisdom is the God himself that dwells in you right now. You know, you see, God is unlimited, but we can limit him with our thinking or lack thereof. Amen? Now, this infinite, eternal God had a desire to make man in his own image, to make man in such a way that he'll be able to commune with him, fellowship with him, live with him, live his life in him and through him, bring him up into him, into his realm, into his arena. This was it because it's like this is what was going to satisfy him. What is man? This is what God wanted. The Bible says from before the foundation, this eternal God before the foundation of the world has spoken things concerning you and I. Second Timothy chapter 1 said he's given us grace. He's given us purpose. He has called us. He has declared stuff concerning you and concerning me. Before he formed us in the womb, even before he ever, he ever planted the stars on the moon. But it comes into reality and it comes into manifestation at the unveiling, at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 4, but according as he had chosen us from the foundation of the world. Romans 8, 29 says it was his plan, it was his purpose from before he ever said, let there be light, that we would be conformed to the image of his son. What am I saying? This awesome God, this was his heart, this was his desire. So he created man, and he was going after his objective. But as you know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, that man sinned. And by sin came death. And that death came upon every man. And the result of that was a separation from this awesome God. Living in a place of darkness. Living in a place of limitation. Limited with this intellect. I remember how much of it there was? The gray matter? Hello? I don't know if it's gray or blue or yellow or what. <laughs> but, I mean, all of a sudden man has come into a place of limitation. This was the same Adam that was naming the animals. All of a sudden that's cut off. All of a sudden, there is strife, there is conflict, there is, there, there is all kinds of, all of the, the hideous things that we see happen. Why? Because of the fall. But it, God says, okay, well, all right, what am I going to do? And throw up his hand, no. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, through to 20, let me just read it quickly. Glory to God. You see, God is so awesome. If you can just grasp for a minute the eternity of God. If you can just, like as I said, if you could think about the fact that, that a lot of what we see out there when we look into the heavens, it left 
billions of years ago before the light arrived here. Well, I tell you, there are words that God spoke from the foundation of the world that you and I are now picking up. Ha, ha, ha. The Bible says that Jesus was slain from before the foundation of the world. We saw it come to pass 2,000 years ago. The Bible says that you were chosen in him from the foundation of the world. Does it not? First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. For as much as you know that you were redeemed, not with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in, in these last days for you. I believe it is. It, it's um, Revelation 13 verse 8 that says Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus came to bring many sons to glory. So even though Adam messed up, God did not change his mind. God had already planned for that from the foundation of the world when Jesus was slain. Are you with me? But now, all that God had planned, all that God had spoken concerning you, concerning I, all of those things, according to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, begin to be made manifest and can now become a reality at the appearing of Jesus Christ, which began on, on what we call Christmas. But then the greater appearing is that unveiling of the Christ that is in you once you're born again. Are you with me? Amen? Say, so here comes Jesus. He comes to fix it all. John the Baptist says, said in, in um, John 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Amen? The Word made flesh. We beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews 2 verse 14 to 17 basically says that being for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He likewise partook of the same. That through death he might, he might destroy him that had the power of death, which is the devil, and deliver those of us who were underneath that fear of death all of our lives. Jesus took upon himself flesh. God, God became a man. God took upon himself flesh. That awesome, infinite God came and took upon himself flesh. What for? So as to redeem us. And that was when God did that, what was God actually doing? God was following the very law of sowing and reaping. He said, uh, he said you see, this, he gives seed to the sow and then multiply the seed sown. So what did he do? He sowed his son into his, the earth. He sowed his very son. The Bible says in Romans, sorry, John chapter 12, verse 24, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Which is to say, except a seed falls into the ground and die, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, then it springs up and it becomes multiplied. Well, God gave his son so that now he can receive many sons to glory. Are you with me? Behold what manner of love that we might be called the sons of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, Jesus came, Jesus paid the price, and so, so, so what? Now it is just for a man, that's what Christmas is about. So that now that this has been done, when the Bible says when you receive him, as many as receive Jesus, to them God gives what? The power to become the sons of God, the children of God. John 1, 12. And, it, and what actually happens in that new birth is that there's an absolute, total exchange that we are only now beginning to comprehend. What do you mean total exchange? Well, here was man in his fallen life coming from Adam, and here was man, but God had this wonderful, glorious, enormous life, which is the very life of Jesus, and God wanted to say, look, let's make an exchange. I'm going to give you Jesus' life, and I'm going to take that old life out of you. And that's what the new birth is about. It's about an exchange. It's about an exchange. It's about an absolute exchange. We break it down and we say he was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. He was made sickness. By his stripes we are healed. He became poor. We might be made rich. He became cursed, that we might be redeemed from the curse. And we go through all of that. But in the final analysis, what it was, it was a life exchange. The very word reconciliation means exchange. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. How God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, making that exchange. You and I as believers, that's the message that we have. 
is to go out there and let folks know God has reconciled you. You don't have to put up with this. You don't have to live this way or that way. You don't have to have that. There's a better life. And it's already been paid for. It's free. You don't have to earn it or anything. All you got to do is receive it. And the Bible says when you receive Jesus, everything that he has comes with him. All of that life comes with him. Galatians 2.20 puts it this way. It says with you, are, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. No, it doesn't say that. That's Colossians. <laughs> it says you are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live. Yet it's not you, but it's what? It is Christ that liveth in you. And the life you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God. Total, perfect exchange. That's what it's all about. You know, the issue of being born again is not a complicated one. It's a simple aspect of accepting, believing and accepting and receiving Jesus. The Bible says when you believe this, that God raised Jesus from the dead and you receive him as Lord, what happens? That exchange takes place. Miraculously, and what happens? You become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, if any man is in Christ, he's what? He's what? New. What do you mean new? New. <laughs> he's a new creation. It's totally new. All things pass away, and what? All things become new. What are these all things that become new? All things become new. Let's examine that just a little bit. What are these all things? Number one, you get a new life. It's no longer that old life, but the life you live is the life of Christ. God gives you Christ's life, which is, and that's God himself as your own. The Bible says, 1 John 4, 9, that herein is the love of God manifested. That we might live through him. Switch it around. That he might live through us. That we might have his life living in us and through us. And that's what Christianity is all about. That is what maturing is all about. Is to learn to function in that life and let that life flow through you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is called in Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, the hope, the confident expectation of the excellency of God becoming your experience. Amen? Colossians 3 verse 4 says, that, your, that, that, that when Christ, who is your life, shall appear. So what is, this? what is this that is new? You've got the life of Christ. You've got the life of God. That's what it's all about. Now let me say something right now as a warning. Sometimes we think this thing is intellectual. Faith is not intellectual. Faith is not reasoning and rationalization. Faith is not what makes sense. Faith is faith. It's a different channel. Amen? Faith is, a, 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 so if you think that, that when you start seeing all of this wonderful stuff that is just going to make sense and you're just going to receive it by some intellectual process, sorry, it's not going to work. It is a faith that it might be by grace. That way the promise is available to everyone. Not only those that may have this or that level of intellect. Amen? Your mind cannot absorb and assimilate the information that comes from thoughts that are so higher than yours. Think about it. So God, so the issue of receiving is going to be an issue of faith. But anyway, to start with, one of the things that are new is that you got a new life. What else is new? You've been brought into a new kingdom. The Bible says in Colossians 1 and verse 13 that, um, uh, that, that um, you've been delivered or translated from the kingdom of darkness. That is the devil's kingdom, the world's kingdom. You've been translated, removed out of that kingdom, and you've been placed into the kingdom of God's dear son. What is the word kingdom? It is God's realm. It is God's sphere. It is God's means of operation. It is where God lives. It's God's arena. It's where he rules. You've been moved into that kingdom. You're in a different kingdom. Remember how it says back in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, that unto us a child is born and a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It goes on to say, and of the increase of his government there shall be no end, and that he will establish the kingdom and order it. Amen? Jesus came to bring a kingdom, a new realm of operation, the kingdom of God here. And what happened? When you get born again, the Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into that kingdom of God. He cannot see into the kingdom of God. It doesn't make sense. Nor can he enter it. But when you are born again, what happened? You enter into this new realm. And it says this kingdom is not meat and drink. It's not, it's not meat and drink. It's not something based on observation. It's righteousness. It's peace. It is joy in the Holy Ghost. This kingdom of God is not flesh and blood. You can't possess it that way. Amen? 
You can't decide I'm going to do yoga. And this is how I'm going to get a hold of the kingdom. No, it don't work that way. But it says when you are born again, you've entered into that kingdom and that kingdom of God is within you. Amen? Luke 17, verse 21. What else is new? Righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says Jesus was made to be what? Sin for us. Why? That we might be made what? The righteousness of God in Christ. But what does that mean? Well, there's a fourfold meaning. Number one, you have right standing with God. Because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, it means you are forgiven. It means you are free from guilt. There is, you are being pardoned. There is no record of any wrong that you've ever done. Forgiveness. It means freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from condemnation. There is no sentence over you of doom. Amen? You're just as if sin has never been. You're justified. You are brought into a place of right relationship with God. Security. Free from insecurity. Brought into his realm. That's one aspect of righteousness. Another aspect of righteousness is this oneness. The Bible says he's the vine, we are the branch. The same life in the vine is in the branch. There's a oneness that takes place. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. My head and my feet, they are one. They have the same blood. They have the same DNA. Well, Jesus and his body are one. There is a oneness that is the essence of this righteousness. And with that comes authority. Number three, the third aspect of righteousness is having the authority. It's having authority as if you were Christ. The, Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to him. And he says, you go in my name. You act like if you were me. Because you are. I'm in you. That is why. Why do we take authority over devils and demons? Why do we do these kind of stuff? Why do we cast out? Why? Because we have authority. What is authority? It's the authority of Christ himself. So in which righteousness, there's that authority. And then, of course, there are rights and privileges. Right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Number four of what else is new? Hope. There's a supernatural divine hope that is not your wishful thinking, but rather is a hope that it's God's hope. The Bible says you were born again onto this living, alive hope that is from God. God's expectation, God's dream, what God knows is done and, fu and fully settled in heaven. This hope is so awesome that the Bible says it can anchor your soul. What does that mean? You see, sometimes in life you have storms coming your way. Not, things don't look right. You don't feel right. Everything is against you. Just like when a, when, a, when a ship is in the sea and there's storms, man, that ship might rock. But if it's anchored, it's not going to go anywhere. Well, so is this supernatural divine hope that is from God so that even in the midst of the storms of life, it can anchor your soul. And it says this hope go, comes from the very presence of God from beyond the veil. There's a supernatural divine hope. That hope is to be like a helmet to guard and protect your mind from the turbulence and the attacks and the accusations of the enemy. The fears and the anxieties about tomorrow. But when I know it's settled, when I know this is what he hopes, and he is the God of that hope, it makes all the difference. So there's a supernatural divine hope. I mean, we are in a world, you open up the newspapers or you listen to the news, and you don't exactly get a lot of hope. But there is hope. And it's a hope that is from God. Amen? Christ in you is that hope. Jesus himself is that hope. And then there's a new faith. The Bible says God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. It says the life you live, you live by the faith of the Son of God. God has given us his very own faith as a gift. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work it up. It is a supernatural divine ability to, to interact with him, to know him, to believe that he is even though you don't see him, and to believe that he's a rewarder. Every human being, God has put that on the inside of him. It is the righteousness of faith. It is only right that God should, should give every man that opportunity and make that available to him. Think about it. Amen? God didn't just give some and say, okay, I like you, but you, I'm sorry. No. Every man, God has dealt to every man the supernatural ability to believe. And he, so, oh, when I see I believe, no, 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 no. You have the ability to believe because God has put it inside of you. Amen? That's how it is. Uh, we don't have time to expand that any further, but this faith is so awesome. It is a confidence. It is a proof of what is not seen. This faith, you know, you don't, you don't speak about, you don't go to court and have proof of something that is going to happen. You have proof of what's already done. It's evidence of what's done. DNA of what's, uh, you know, to, to verify certain things or, or there's eyewitnesses to say, I saw. But the Bible says faith is the evidence of what is not seen. Faith is the evidence of that hope. 
faith is the proof that it is so. Amen? And it will also have the supernatural power that when you release that faith to cause that which is, which is unseen, which is an unseen hope that is in God to become a reality in this natural realm. Hallelujah. Hello? And then there's a new love. The Bible says the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. I mean, there's situations that we can't naturally love in. Can you imagine if you went through the Holocaust? To love some of those folks that, that put your brother and sister and folks in the oven? Kind of hard. But it's the love of God that he's put in our heart that makes it possible. It is the love of God whereby Jesus would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was the love of God that even when Stephen was being stoned, he said, Father, forgive them. I wonder what would have happened to, to Saul who was there, Saul who became Paul that was part of that mob that was stoning Stephen and was behind it. What would have happened if, 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 if Stephen did not, did, not, did not release forgiveness towards him? Would Paul have made it? And if he didn't make it, would we have had all these 13 epistles? What am I saying? But where does that power to be able to forgive in unforgivable situations? It is the love of God that has been shed abroad in our heart. Amen? It's a new love. We, we've got a new nature. The Bible says we are partakers of his divine nature. There is a new grace. It is, it's the, the, Jesus, the, the law was given by Moses. Grace came through Jesus Christ. There is a new peace, a peace that passes all understanding. Jesus says the peace that I give to you is not the peace of the world that I give to you. He says my peace I give unto you. What is this peace? It is that same peace that has reconciled everything to God's original intent. <laughs> There is even a new tongue. Amen? The Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And they will speak in what? New tongues. There's power. There's anointing. And the list can go on and on. There is so much that is new. But what point is it for a believer if all these things are new, but they're not walking in that newness of life? They're not appropriating it. They're not even acknowledging it. Amen? Paul said that when he was assigned back, when God called him and sent him out to the Gentiles and sent him out to preach this gospel, Paul said part of his assignment was to get them to receive their forgiveness of sins and to receive their inheritance by faith. So all of this stuff that belongs to you, that comes to you in a new birth, you still have to receive it. In other words, it's yours, it's in the bank account, but you got to go make some withdrawals. You got to at least acknowledge and know what is there. Amen? So all this new stuff, all of this stuff, you got to find out what it is, but it must be received. The Bible says you got to acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ. You receive by faith. Now I'm just going to mention three things just to start with to, 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 that one needs to receive. The number one place to start is receiving Jesus. The Bible says, as many as receive him, to them give you power to become the sons of God. When you receive Jesus... Everything that, that he is comes with it. All that he has comes with it. The Bible says, Romans 8, verse 32, that when God, he that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give you what? All things. So when Jesus comes, everything comes with it. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing where? In heavenly places in Christ. Anything that I mentioned, anything that is new, it's in Christ, it comes with it. You are joined heir with Christ and an heir of God to what? All things. The kingdom comes, the life comes, the righteousness comes, the new nature comes, the love comes, the peace comes, the joy comes, the power comes, the anointing comes. All of it comes with him. So the first place to begin is to receive Jesus. The inheritance come. How do you receive Jesus? You just ask him into your life. You just acknowledge that, he, that he's been raised up from the dead and you say, Jesus, I receive you as Lord. Second thing, of the, uh, second thing to receive is the Holy Spirit. The disciples, when they heard that the folks in, in, in Samaria had received the word of God and they were born again, they sent down, but then they heard that they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So they went down there, preached to them about the Holy Spirit, lay hands on them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. It's very important because the, the having the Holy Spirit is having empowerment. You know, it's wanting to be a police officer and just have the uniform and be able to stop traffic because you have the uniform and a nice glove or something. But then if you have some renegade person that is saying, no, I don't care what, you, what uniform you have. I'm just going to drive right along. 
and I'm going to run you over. There ain't much the policeman could do. But you give him a cruise missile, you give him some weaponry, and let somebody decide, you know what? I'm just going to ride, ride right over him. Man, he's got some arsenal to, for enforcement. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not good enough. Thank God. It's, hey, being born again gets you a ticket to heaven. That's good. But it's good to also to have the power of the Holy Ghost to live while you're here. So that's the second thing that one must also receive. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 11, verse 10 to 13, that everyone that asks receives. You and I as parents, we don't give our children stone if they ask for bread. We're not going to give them a serpent if they ask for egg. But then it says, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? To his children. Once somebody's born again, then the Holy Ghost is a free gift that belongs to them, that is reserved for them. And then number three, you've got to receive the word of God. It says in James 1 verse 21, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So you got to receive Jesus, go on from there, receive the Holy Ghost, and then begin to get a hold of the Word of God, study the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God, find out what the Word of God says, find out what belongs to you, feed on it, and receive it. Amen? Now, how do you receive anything? Whether it be the Word, whether it be Jesus, whether it be, whether it be the righteous, how do you receive anything from God? Well, it's not by the intellect. It is by faith. The Bible says it is a faith that it might be by grace. It says in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, you are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is by faith that you receive. What does this faith look like? Let's just turn here as we, as, as, as we wrap this up. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Say, I receive by faith. Amen. You got to tune into the right radio station, you know. All right? You got to go to the Faith Channel. You can't go to some FM, whatever it is, and expect to, to get the broadcast from the Faith Channel. Amen? You can't go to the reason realm and the rationalization and intellect and, and all of that stuff. No, it's not going to work. Or feeling. What makes sense? No. You don't broadcast over there. Buy a strap, some heel is not on that channel. <laughs> Hello? Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 says, We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore speak. So how does this faith operate? Well, this faith to start with believes according to God. It believes according to the word of God. It believes the way God speaks. That's why you got to get his thoughts. That's why you got to hear from him. It believes according to God. That's why Abraham, everything shifted in Abraham's life. Because when he got to the place where before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and called those things that be not as though they were, when Abraham made, those shit, made that shift and he was almost 100 years old, what happened? He got a baby. He became the father of many nations. Isn't that right? But that's because, but that, was, that didn't make any natural sense. There was not natural hope. What am I saying? First of all, you got to believe according as it is written. You got to believe according as God speaks it, as according to God has spoken it, not according. And the fact of the matter is, it was spoken a long time ago. It's already established in heaven. Amen? Then, number two, you got you to believe accordingly and you got to speak according to the Word of God. You got to speak according to the Word of God and act according to the Word of God. It goes on to say here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let me jump down to verse 15. It says, all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace, abundant grace. Let me talk to you about grace for a moment. When a baby is born into this world, come out of the womb, there's air here. Some adjustments happen and the babies begin to breathe air. Did they have to earn that air? Did they have to work for it? No, it's there. What do they do? They breathe it. And whatever oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, whatever, else, it's just there. When you are born again, you are born there. The grace of God has been lavishly poured out. It's here. It's a matter of receiving it. You don't have to earn it. So anyway, it goes on to say that that abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God for which cause we faint not. All things are for your sakes. That the abundant grace through the thanksgiving of many might, re might redound to the glory of God for which cause we faint not. Now hear this for a moment. 
It is wonderful for me to stand here and teach that, all right, you believe according to it is written. And even though it looks differently, even though you feel different, and even though the reasoning and the logic and, and what the doctors report and the bank account and everything else says something different, it is easy for me to say, believe according to this. But what is going to happen when all these challenges come? What is going to happen when these contradictions come? What is going to happen when you have all this conflict? What do you do? If you listen to that, it will cause you to faint. If you believe that this is going to destroy you, you're going to become discouraged. So the Bible says, don't faint. Don't become discouraged. But this is how you do it. You keep looking on to Jesus. You keep looking on to the word. Amen? In other words, then, this that seems to be against me, I better make sure I have a mindset that even though this thing seems to be against me, this weapon formed against me will not prosper because he said so. And this too will work together for my good because I love God and I'm in line with his purpose. And this here that seems to be, that is out to destroy me, I, dec I see that it, this too is for my sake. And because I can see that this thing is for my sake, I can give thanks to God and not faint. But if I don't do that, I will not be able to give thanks, and I wouldn't be able to, and I will faint. Are you with me? That's very, very important. Because don't forget this faith is going to work because you believe right, because you talk right, and because you act right. But there's going to be opposition. And the opposition is going to come from the sense realm, what it looks like and what it feels like. So it goes on to say, for which cause we faint not, even though our outward man is perishing, yet we know the inward man is renewed day by day. Even though I'm experiencing some stuff that is uncomfortable, I know that the same power that raised up Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of me. I know that our resurrection power is on the inside of me, and this inner man is renewed day by day. And I make that my focus, and not that my focus. And what will happen? The Bible says this light affliction, this discomfort will work within me a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, but on this condition, that I'm not looking at the things that are seen, but I'm looking at the things that are not seen. I'm looking onto Jesus, the author, the finisher, the developer, the perfecter, the upholder of my faith, so that even if I miss it, even if I run short, he's the one that's going to perfect and fill the gap for me, so that I faint not. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Because discouragement is a reality that we have to deal with. But how do you deal with it? You got to keep looking on to Jesus. You got to stay with the word. You cannot be moved. Here's a little secret and I'm going to close here. God says, he says, my word is not going to return void. You get a hold of my thoughts through my word. And my word is not going to return void. But here's what you must do with it. It says in Psalm 17 verse 4. They that love my salvation, love my deliverance, love the healing, love the victory, love the prosperity. Let them say continually. Let them say continually. Keep the word in your mouth. Psalms 35, 27 says, let them shout for joy that favor is righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God get excited when you prosper. God get excited when you heal. God, get ex God is blessed and God, I mean, God does a couple of backflips or whatever the case is when he sees you having victory. He delights in it, but for your part is you have to say continually. Eve was deceived. You know why the Bible says Eve was deceived? Because the devil was able to pull her over into the reason realm. That's why. And she departed away from the simplicity. Well, you and I can also be deceived, but we must not be. We must not be pulled away from the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of faith, which is simply what? Believing according as he has spoken. Speaking what he has said and nothing else. And what? Acting accordingly. And don't say anything different. And just stay there. The Bible says you will weep if you faint not. Are you with me? So this occasion of Christmas, it is about a whole brand new newness of life that we are to walk in. Jesus came to make all things new. He came to give us new hope, new joy, new peace, and a new life. His very own life. And this God that is so awesome, so magnificent, so eternal, so wonderful, says, look, I want to share my life with you, and I'm going to give it to you, but you give me yours. Let's exchange. Let's exchange. You give me yours, I give you mine. What's the deal? What's the good? Is that a good deal or not? <laughs> Hallelujah. How do we do this? You say, just receive me. You receive Jesus, and you got it all. And then you learn as you go. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
Ha, ha, ha. Let's stand for a moment. Lembo ndoro si kebebe. Leke boromondi kebebe na mana tasata. Ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. So Romans therefore says, and Ephesians, you've been raised up with him. You've been made to sit together with him in heavenly places. Therefore, you ought to walk in this newness of life. Walk in this newness of life. Come to find out the details of it and walk in it. But where does it begin? It begins, first of all, with Jesus. Everyone here might be saved. Everyone here might not be saved. But there are people, there are people that, are, that are part of the, of, of the internet church, that are part of the, the live stream that are out there. There are people that are listening to this service all over the world, and it's, and it's going to be increasing even more. And Jesus died not just for you and me, but he died for every single one. God so loved the world that he gave his own son so that he can get back many sons and that those of us can have eternal life, which is not life, is not merely life forever. It is the quality of life. It's the God kind of life. Amen? And I think it would be a great injustice if I share this here today and there is someone out there listening and they're saying, yes, I want this. How can I have it? Can you help me? Just pray this after me. Every one of us here, let's pray this. Even if you've never prayed, even if you've prayed it before, pray it anyway. Just to be in support of those that might be praying it for the first time out there on the internet or wherever else. Just say this with me. Say, Father in heaven, I believe your word. And I thank you for Christmas. Your gift to me is Jesus. So that I can have your life. I do believe that Jesus died, that he was raised up from the dead, that he's alive today. And I want that same Jesus to be alive in me. So Jesus, I receive you into my life. And Father, I thank you. Because of Jesus' shed blood, his death, burial, resurrection, and everything that he did, I can have his life. I can have his peace. So I receive his life. I receive Jesus' peace. I receive his strength. I receive anointing to break every yoke and every bondage off of my life. I receive your love. I receive forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. I am now righteous. I don't have to become righteous. I don't have to do righteous. I am righteous. It is a gift. And I receive it. I'm free from condemnation. Free from guilt. Free from shame. It's all washed away. And Father, in your presence, here I stand. You see me as holy and blameless and spotless. And you accept me. And I thank you. I thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus and for salvation. Jesus, I receive you and I declare you as Lord of my life. Amen.